former Navy captain and the CEO of Metron, Van Gurley. Thank you for being here. What are some of the reasons that a submarine like this with this mission would have lost contact? Uh, uh, good morning, Marty. It's a pleasure to join you. Before uh, that, I just want to state what I think everybody's feeling, which is our thoughts and prayers go out to the people that are on the submersible and their friends and families and colleagues that are waiting for word. It's a very, very difficult situation now that it's, you know, we're into sort of day three of uh, the event, um, but there is still hope. Now, in terms of how this could have happened, there's a couple of different scenarios. Uh, one scenario, and the lost comms were near the end of their descent. One scenario is they did, they did get to the bottom and somehow got entangled in something, and that's preventing the automatic surfacing feature from bringing the submersible back up. Uh, that doesn't explain the loss of communications, though. Uh, the second scenario is it could have been some type of electrical failure uh, that maybe took out some of the propulsion, took out the communications. That would explain the loss of comms, but it doesn't explain the fact that the, sur the automatic servicing feature hasn't been able to work yet. Uh, and then, unfortunately, the third scenario is, is some type of fire or other catastrophic failure uh, of the vessel at depth because that far down, uh, the ocean pressure on the hull is is uh, three tons per square inch. It's just unfathomably harsh and difficult down there, and the least little thing ends, uh, would lead to a catastrophic failure very, very quickly. And what are the conditions inside if they are that far down and they're waiting on rescue inside a submersible? I mean, is it cold? Is it dark? Can they see or do anything to maneuver? A lot of that depends on the status of the electrical system. Uh, if the electrical system is still working and the batteries are still have enough charge, uh, they would have some propulsion. So if they're hung up on something, maybe they can get themselves disentangled. That's probably, that window's probably closing though. Uh, the other thing that's really important is a little bit of light because it is pitch black down there, no sunlight whatsoever, and it is very cold down there. Uh, ocean temperature at that depth is somewhere between 35 and 39 degrees Fahrenheit. And at this amount of exposure, with, with no heaters, it would be very, very cold inside that uh, that vehicle. Van, I want to talk about the search itself. What are some of the challenges covering this much water at these deep depths? Depths. Well, there's me. actually yeah, no, great question. Uh, there's actually two searches going on simultaneously right now. One is a search of the ocean surface to make sure if the vessel did come back to the surface but doesn't have any communications, they can find it. Uh, so that is why you hear the Coast Guard commander talking about C-130s and support vessels doing a, a search that so far he, he said this morning was about the size of the state of Connecticut. Uh, the Coast Guard is really good at that, but that's just long and laborious. You, it's, it's a lot of people looking out windows and scanning, scanning the ocean surface, looking for something. You can also pick up with, a, with radar systems something sticking out of the water, especially anything metal. Now, the ocean bottom search is a very different problem. Um, and that, it sounds like, it may not have really even started. Um, th at those depths, uh, 12,500 feet, there are a limited number of vehicles that can get, that can get down that deep. And I, what I heard in the morning uh, press release or a morning interview this morning from the Coast Guard commander is they now have some vehicles on scene that can get down to the bottom. And I think that part's starting today. But as was talked about in, in, in just your previous uh, reporter, the best thing the crew can do is bang on the hole because the sound travels very far in the ocean. So if they're able to make noise, it will get picked up with the kinds of sensors that have already been deployed in that area. Uh, but if they have to go do an unaided uh, search of the bottom, there may not be enough time left uh, to accomplish that. Uh, two real quick questions. So whatever equipment they send down, would that be unmanned? And then two, once they find it, if it is on the bottom, what's the process of safely bringing it back to the surface? Correct, yeah, so all the vehicles um, that can get down to that, that deep are unmanned vehicles. Uh, in the U.S. Navy, the the, submers the rescue sub uh, vehicles are all unmanned at this point and only go down to about 2,000 feet. So uh, anything going to the bottom is gonna be an unmanned ROV, meaning it's tethered to the support ship so they can control it and see video of what, what, what it's seeing. In terms of recovering uh, the Triton, uh, based on what I understand of its design, it would have to be floated back to the surface. It doesn't have any kind of airlock or capability so you could pull people out of it. Uh, so you have to bring the whole vessel back to the surface to be able to open the hatch and uh, and get the people off. And I know I'm out of time, but if it is on the bottom, how long would that process take given the pressure inside the Titan? Um, 
Very hard to say because, you know, two and a half miles down, there's no way to, you know, send a cable down to try to lift it. You're going to have to use buoyancy bags or other modules to to try to break it free from whatever's holding it on the bottom, if that's where it is, and then and then have it rise to the surface. Uh, basically, big balloon, big airbags you'd have to fit and attach to the uh, vessel. Thank you for watching. Go to newsnationnow.com to find News Nation on your television provider. And don't forget to click the red subscribe button below to get more of News Nation's fact-driven, unbiased coverage.